Howdy, everyone. Uh, welcome to the COVID-19 adaption of your documentation and general compliance training. Let me start by saying I'm super sad not to be uh, with you and to see you all, especially those of you that have actually yet to meet in person. This training is going to be a lot of information, so it might be good that it's being delivered in this format, just so that you can go back and rewatch um, anything that you might have questions on. For those of you who have been around for a while, some of this will look familiar, but trust me, we can all use a little refresher on this stuff. Um, for those of you hearing this for the first time, um, remember I'm only a phone call or email away, so if you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. I just wish I could be there to take them in person. So let's begin. Um, this training is comprised of four sections. The documentation portion is going to take the longest. The HIPAA general compliance and code of conduct sections, they're gonna be short, but they're gonna require some extensive reading and homework. Compliance is a mandatory training. By completing all four of these training requirements listed here, you'll help the city and the fire department meet its obligation. So we're gonna get started. Start with our documentation patient care documentation. So it's imperative that we do a thorough job documenting the important work that we do and the care that we provide to all of our patients that we see. And Medicare states that both the ambulance and the personnel must be required in order to meet medical necessity. And this means that we need to document that we are doing more than just providing transportation. Medical necessity uh, according to Medicare, means that healthcare services or supplies are needed to prevent, diagnose, or treat an illness, injury, condition, or disease, or its symptoms, and that those services or supplies meet an accepted standard of medicine. They go further to define ambulance medical necessity by, by saying Medicare and Medicaid cover ambulance services only if they're furnished to a beneficiary whose medical condition is such that other means of transportation are contraindicated. So what this means is they will not pay for an ambulance transport if the patient could have safely been transported in a car or wheelchair van. Transporting the patient by those other means would not endanger their health or safety. So ask yourself this question, what am I doing for this patient that contraindicates transport by other means? Why do they need to be transported in an ambulance? And why would trained medical personnel in the back? And then be sure to do the most important part, document it. Does anyone remember what this number represents? We've talked about this in earlier trainings and this is where I wish I was there with you in person because I really enjoy hearing some of the answers. But basically, this boils down to it's the national average amount of time spent teaching EMS documentation in EMT and paramedic course curriculum. So that's right about a third of 1% of the time. So it's always the responsibility of the ambulance supplier to furnish complete and accurate documentation to demonstrate that ambulance service being furnished meets the medical necessity criteria. So that's on you and that's in the federal register. It has to speak specifically to your documentation. So how do you do that? You capture all of that information on the electronic patient care report, the EPCR. And here's the deal. We all know that documentation is not why you're working in this field. Taking care of people is the reason you're here. So we're gonna talk about that. Because if I had a dollar for every time I heard I did not get into this line of field to write reports and do paperwork, I would be retired now. So think about this. If you were on a call with your partner and let's say they're providing excellent clinical care, they're following all the protocols, they're giving the right doses at the right time, getting the right response from the patient, but they were treating the patient really rude and were verbally abusive and um, basically being mean to the patient. Would you call that good patient care? You're doing everything right clinically, and that's why you got into this was to take care of people. Well, poor documentation is basically financial abuse to the patient. 
um, it is part of your patient care because your charts are not reviewed on what you did for the patient. We know that you're providing good patient care. They're reviewed on what you document that you did for the patient. So we live in an era of, elect of electronics and there's no escaping the technology at this point. It's how data is analyzed. So you've all heard of WIMSYS, NEMSYS, that's all data and they're pulling that information from your data fields. Data fields in ESO consists of your flow chart, your vitals, your assessment, that type of information. Data fields do not stand in for a narrative, however. Both are required and both must be timely, complete, accurate, and consistent with one another. So how do you do that? Review, review what you've written. Uh, maybe even have your partner review this. Um, after all, they're gonna be signing off on your patient care report and you just might be able to um, learn something or share some ideas. You might find some missed information. Maybe your partner will say, hey, didn't you give that patient oxygen? I don't see it anywhere in this report. Um, so they might help you in that way. You might learn a better way or they might learn a better way of documenting their own charts. They might read yours and I've never thought of, it, of documenting it that way. That flow is really nice. Maybe I'm gonna start doing that in my patient care reports now. Or you might pick on, up on little things um, such as typos. Um, some people use the spell check and that's fine as long as you're not in, you know, accidentally putting a word in there that's a real word, but just in the inappropriate spot. So here's an example here. Um, patient's been having chest pain since the previous day and has been refusing to go until not. Well, I think we all probably know that that was supposed to say it in now, until now. And then down below it says patient states that the pain really states in her back and radiates to her chest. So again, states is a real word, but your spell check's not catching that. A lot of times when you write something, you see the words written as you intended for them to um, come across. When a partner or a complete stranger is reading that, they may they pick up on these little things. So um, always helpful if you can get that person who's signing off on your report to actually read it. Uh, you can also review your own report. You do this by going into the little hamburger menu up, and it's best to do this while your call is still in draft status and hasn't been locked in ESO yet because that way if you find something, you can go back and fix it. If you use that little hamburger and you choose the print option and then you'll give, be given the option of the type of document you'd like to print. If you choose the billing report, um, it will bring up your entire report to include any of the attachments. So you can make sure that your EKG snapshot is included, your face sheet is included and all the proper signatures. So once you do that, you can just kind of scroll through the flow of your chart and you might see discrepancies such as this. The assessment portion um, indicates that a previous patient had a previous CVA with left side deficits. However, down below in the teeny tiny little narrative that we did for this sample purpose, um, it states that uh, it's got a history of stroke with the right side weakness. An IV attempt was unsuccessful uh, do I have it up here? Up here in the uh, flow chart, it says that it was successful. So this is one way you can kind of just flow through your chart and see any discrepancies and maybe see what's missing. Um, for example, you know, I see many times the ALS, ALS assessment entered, but it's got a BLS provider listed. So this is where you would just, you know, by scrolling through this chart, see those obvious uh, discrepancies. So the treatments that you document in the narrative should be included in the flow chart because this is where the retrievable data can be found. So let's say Dr. Russell wants to look at, okay, everybody who has a primary impression of respiratory distress, how many of those people received oxygen? Well, that information is gonna be pulled from the flow chart. There's no way that it can be pulled out of the narrative. So um, just kind of an example to make sure that all those interventions are included in the flow chart portion. Um, treatment, treatments that are documented in a flow chart should have the clinical indications and the supporting uh, information documented in the narrative. So your 
PCR is the central document that billers rely upon in determining whether or not the patient's condition meets the medical necessity criteria. So it needs to be factual, truthful, it needs to be thorough, complete, timely, and accurate. Here's this cute little statement that um, really should apply to all documentation that you do. It needs to be completely honest and honestly complete. No omissions for whatever reason. And by complete and timely, we don't mean passing validation um, and locking the call by the end of your shift. It means going in and reviewing to make sure that everything is there supporting um, the patient's condition, the treatment, the assessment. And your PCR must always contain a detailed description of the patient's physical, medical, and mental condition at the time of transport. And this is accomplished with documentation of a thorough patient assessment and accurate history. Your role is to document the patient's condition and treatment accurately and completely so that the billing team can properly determine the appropriate payer for the transport. If the patient's medical condition does not meet medical necessity, Medicare shifts the liability to the patient. So the patient will receive that eight or $900 bill. If they're on Medicaid, the agency eats that transport. And these both happen, they both can happen, they do happen, and that's okay. But it's imperative that it be based on good documentation and not the lack thereof. So Medicare does kind of give us an outline for uh, medical necessity criteria examples. Some of them apply uh, towards the end, will apply just to non-emergent uh, transports, interfacility type transports. Uh, but this just kind of gives you a good idea of what they're looking for. So it says the patient was transported in an emergency situation as a result of an accident, injury, or acute illness. And we'll talk about that a little bit further in a minute. Or the patient needed to be restrained to prevent injury uh, to the patient or perhaps others if the patient was unconscious or in shock. The patient required oxygen or other emergency treatment during transport to the nearest appropriate facility, and that can't be their home administered oxygen. The patient exhibits signs and symptoms of acute respiratory distress or cardiac distress, such as shortness of breath or chest pain. They exhibit signs and symptoms that indicate the possibility of an acute stroke or they had to remain, be, remain immobile because of a fracture that had not been set or the possibility of a fracture. Because remember, you're, you don't diagnose, you don't have the tools to make that diagnosis. So um, pain from an accident could be a possibility of a fracture. Patient was experiencing severe hemorrhage. Patient could only be moved by stretcher. And when that is what we're relying on for medical necessity, it's imperative that we know why, what condition makes them or symptoms make it uh, necessary to be moved by stretcher, not just that they were. And then finally, a patient was bed confined before and after the transport. That means they're unable to ambulate, unable to sit in a chair or wheelchair, and uh, unable to get out of bed without any assistance. And again, you should document why. Have they suffered a stroke? They have contractures, that type of thing. Um, though that's going to apply more to your non-emergent type inner facility transports, but always something to keep in mind as a tool uh, in your documentation for medical necessity. Now I want to take some examples. Um, these been, were taken uh, specifically out of ESO reports. Some were from the city of Cedar Woolley, some were from the city of Burlington. So I um, apologize if you see something here. I tried to de-identify anything that I thought would um, show the provider. So if you recognize um, one of your reports, um, maybe just take a chance and look at it in a different perspective. So first of all, this example number one was uh, generalized weakness. Um, and then I went on to uh, just kind of copy and paste what was documented here. Patient exam, vitals, glucometry, temperature check, assist patient to gurney, seat belts fastened, arm rails raised, advice schedule of incoming patient, transport patient to SVH, transferred care, or transferred self from gurney to bed, transferred care to RN. Is that telling me why this patient needed an ambulance with trained medical personnel in the back? 
kind of not. I mean, really, you could insert transport patient to SVH while in route. I finished writing my report from the night before and took a quick little power nap. So let's uh, maybe look at an alternative documentation. We all know that's not what happened, right? Maybe something like this. A patient was assisted via two-person lift from the floor onto the gurney and moved to the ambulance. Due to the unknown ideology of his weakness, his vitals were continuously monitored for any changes in route to the hospital. This defines how you assisted the patient to the gurney, and it helps paint a picture of a patient with weakness. And it defines what you're doing for this patient that could not have been done by a family member in their own vehicle. You're continuously monitoring for any changes in route to the hospital. The second example, this was a minor injury, permission to treat, vital signs, cleared C-spine, medical history, patient moved to stretcher under his own power, secured to stretcher with seat belts, armrests, transport BLS, non-priority to Skagit. Patient moved to hospital bed under his own power, secured with armrest, transfer care to ER staff. Okay, we may as well insert, <laughs> again, what are you doing for this patient? Patient was able to ambulate to the stretcher without difficulty. So we just had him hop in the rig and we provided a taxi ride over to Skagit at the patient's request and then et cetera. Maybe we all know that's not what happened. So maybe something like this. Permission to treat, vital signs, cleared C-spine, medical history. Patient moved to stretcher under his own power, secured to stretcher with seat belts and armrests. Due to concerns regarding his head injury and anticoagulated status, the patient's level of consciousness and vitals were continuously monitored for any changes while en route to Skagit. So this defines how an ambulatory patient with a minor injury can still be a significant medical concern and legitimizes the need for your continuous monitoring um, in the back of the ambulance. Okay, uh, third example, uh, alcohol intoxication, uh, transport, and here again is the P portion of the soap. Uh, patient assisted to stretcher with assistance by Cedral PD, phone report to United, non-priority transport, transferred patient care to attending RN with no further questions, RN signed section three authorization for transport due to altered level of consciousness. So, I mean, we could insert something like, while I'm out to the hospital, I checked my phone for Facebook updates and responded to a few friend requests. We're not getting that sense of what you're doing for this patient besides sticking them in the back of the ambulance and driving them there, okay? So we could do something like this. Patient was very unsteady on his feet and unable to stand or ambulate without falling. He was assisted to the gurney by two Cedar Woolley PD officers and loaded for transport. While en route, his vitals, airway, and respiratory status was continually monitored due to his suspected alcohol overdose and decreased level of consciousness. This describes how the patient was assisted and why it was necessary. And it also shows what you're doing that couldn't be done by the SCAT bus driver. You're continually monitoring this patient en route. And remember, Unless it's documented, according to Medicare, it didn't happen. So I know it seems like, yeah, we do that. They should just know that we do that. But if it's not documented, it did not happen. So be sure to write that. Here's a fourth, I think, final ex example here, possible fracture or injury. The person who wrote this report um, had a habit, they don't do this anymore, of putting I think it was either their name or unit number at the beginning of every sentence. So I just kind of blocked that out, but they arrived on scene. They assumed patient care and started performing patient assessment. They took vitals, patient requests that she would like transportation to SVH. And we'll talk about that statement and how it's really not helpful in any way whatsoever. Um, assisted patient via walking to the gurney, loaded the patient in the back of the medic unit, performed a secondary patient assessment, took vitals, transport one BLS in the supine position to Skagit with no further complaints, had patient signed for transport, transferred patient from medic unit to ER room, had patient walk from gurney to ER bed, gave short transferred patient care to ER nurse, returned to service. Okay. So um, again, we could have just with that documentation about the transport, we could have added 
that while in route, I uh, called my mom to see how she was doing. I wished her a happy birthday. So um, again, we all know that that is not what happened, right? How about something like this? The patient was able to ambulate to the stretcher with limited assistance while self-splinting her right arm to her abdomen. She was placed to pine on the stretcher with a pillow under her right elbow for support. Her vitals and position of comfort were monitored en route. So that's painting a much different picture than a patient requesting a ride to Skagit. All of these examples tell the truth. They're truthful and factual. However, which ones paint a full picture of medical necessity? So we want, when you're writing your narrative, we want you to tell a story so that the reader sees what you see. Right here, we're seeing, um, well, you can see what you're seeing, but maybe this is what's really going on. And if we're only getting the top part of the story, then we're not having the full picture painted. Um, if you don't paint a full picture and tell the whole story, we're seeing a cute little panda when really it's an anteater. Okay, all of the information. Now I'm going to pick on somebody and I'm really sorry if you figure out who it is, but it's not intentional. But I just, I happened to come across this call and I wanted to use it as an example of two different ways that documentation can be provided in order to make it crystal clear for billing staff. So we're dispatched to the clinic over at Hospital Drive, the, I don't remember the name of it, physician something clinic. On the second floor, um, there was pain from a fall on Friday in the rib area. So it looks like the RN from the facility is calling us um, for this dispatch. Here's the report as written. Cedral Relief Fire Department 85529 dispatched to a 63-year-old female stated she was just seen at the Peace Health Clinic and did not feel steady or safe on her feet. She did not want to walk over to the hospital from her car because she felt unsteady and unsafe. Patient also stated she was having some rib pain, right rib pain, which is normal for her, but it got worse after a fall that happened on Friday. And that's why she was seen at the clinic today. EMS was unable to obtain all medical history, allergies, and medications because of the short transport time. Cedro Woolley Fire 85529 arrived on scene to find patients standing outside smoking a cigarette at her car. Patient stated she was unsteady on her feet and felt it was dangerous for her to walk alone over to the hospital. 5529 transported BLS to UGH in a position of comfort from the Peace Health Clinic. All vitals stable and can be found in the vitals tab above. Possible irritation from a fall making pain condition worse. So uh, 5529 took appropriate safety precautions, arrives on scene, ABCs initiated patient assessment, vitals, patient helped to ambulance via assisted walk, patient transported BLS to United in a position of comfort, care transfer, uh, patient transferred from stretcher to hospital bed via blanket carry, uh, patient care transferred to UGH, ERRN, Cedar Rural Fire Back in Service. Okay, so that's um, how the report was written. I don't know if you're asking yourself the same questions I asked myself, Maybe I'm looking at it from a different perspective, but we're looking to have a full, full picture uh, painted here. So there's questions to consider um, documenting or asking and a short transport time um, is really um, not really a good excuse for um, poor history. You're on scene there, you're job is to get the history and document the history. Um, if this was a critical patient and you're flying somewhere to get a patient to airlift, then okay, maybe you don't have time to, to ask these questions, but they are very pertinent to this patient care report. So how did the patient get from the dispatch location on the second floor down to the parking lot? How did she do on a test drive? Did you have her try to walk? What does she attribute her unsteadiness to? If you don't know, Ask. These are questions that should be asked as part of the assessment. And what were the findings at her clinic appointment and their suggested course of treatment or action? So the history has to be obtained in order to provide good patient care and to provide thorough, complete, accurate, and honest documentation. So here's one way that this same report could have been written. 
5529 arrived on scene. The patient was standing outside her car smoking a cigarette. The staff at the clinic assisted her down to her car, but she reports that she was unable to get herself into a seated position to drive over to the ER due to severe 8 out of 10 rib pain from her fall. She states she is unsteady on her feet due to her Parkinson's disease and in light of recent falls does not feel safe ambulating even that short distance. We had patient attempt to ambulate where she grasped her rib cage and expressed exacerbated pain. She did not appear unsteady and looked to be at risk for a fall. We, was, we assisted her with a provider on each side to the medic unit where we placed her in a semi-fowler's position, which she reported relieved some of her pain and transported her to United. Okay, that paints a picture, it's pretty clear as to why this patient needs an ambulance. Here's another example. And by the way, neither one of these examples is the right answer. Both of them are right, just depending on you asking the appropriate questions and gathering pertinent information. So here's the other example. Cedar Rolly Fire 15 to 529 arrived on scene to find patients standing outside of her car smoking a cigarette. She states she was able to get from the second floor of the clinic down to her car without assistance. She now requires a ride across the parking lot because she feels unsteady on her feet and felt it was dangerous to walk over to the hospital. She complains of two out of 10 rib pain due to a previous injury from a fall four days earlier. We took the patient for a test drive and had her ambulate with a provider nearby on each side should she require assistance. She was able to ambulate without assistance on her own and did not appear to be unsteady. When asked about the findings at her earlier appointment at the clinic, she tells us that they took an x-ray and believe her rib area is just bruised. When questioned about driving herself and alternative transport op options were, and destinations are suggested, she becomes uncooperative and aggressive to EMS providers. We provided a courtesy ride across the parking lot to avoid further aggravating the patient. So that paints a clear picture. This does not meet medical necessity and we're not going to bill it. Whereas the previous one um, does paint that picture. So all those questions have to be answered, be thorough, be complete, so that as billing staff, we're able to make that determination. Okay, 99% of your time, your destination is going to be the closest facility. And this goes back to that report example that we looked at where it said patient requested ride to SVH. Schedule, we don't care where they request to go unless the only time it's pertinent is if we're going out of our locality. So if patient requests to go from Cedar Woolley to Providence and Everett or even St. Joe's, that's, and we're transporting them to them to that destination strictly because they're requesting that. And then we want to know um, that information. Otherwise, closest facility, it should always be your choice for your destination um, disposition. And also, um, it, that's very much driven by protocol and the locality. Um, and the, we can get into the locality rule, but bottom line um, for locality, it means transport to both Skagit and United uh, fall within our local locality. And what that means is people who live in the, let's say, Cedro Woolley area, 98284 zip code, a high enough percentage of those people go to Skagit for routine medical care um, that it's considered part of our locality. If you are transporting, let's say you're up in Alger and you have a patient that wants to go to St. Joe's, St. Joe's would be within that locality because there are enough patients in that area that utilize St. Joe's as their main um, medical facility. So both Skagit and United will be closest facility here. And we don't really care about which one they request to go to. Speaking of transport, we're gonna review mileage again and the use of this little calculated mileage tool that's built into ESO. It's allowed uh, by Medicare, but it's allowed as an exception. It's not the preferred method to capture your loaded miles. CMS guidance states beginning and ending odometer readings are to be documented in the patient care report. And the other and most important thing, and I just had ex two exact examples of this, Google doesn't know the actual route that you're traveling. 
So we have a situation where you're out on District Line Road and it's rush hour, you're not gonna take a patient down Burlington Boulevard to get to Skagit. You're likely gonna go out, Cook Road, get on the freeway and jump off on Kincaid. So that's gonna be your actual mileage. Google's gonna send you on the shortest route and it's many times not going to be the route that uh, was chosen. Um, the other example I can give you where it's helpful to have the odometer reading um, entered is we had a patient where we accidentally chose the wrong destination. We chose that we transported them to United from Cedar Woolley. So it calculated 2.1, I think, miles using that tool. Well, had the odometer readings been entered, we would have probably got a 10 or 11 mile uh, reading. And that would have been a big clue that something's going on with this destination and to look at a little bit further. So it can work both ways. We can, we can put in too few, mile, few miles if we have that wrong destination, or we can put in um, not enough miles, or did I say that right? <laughs> not enough miles if we take a different route. So try to have the driver obtain the beginning and ending odometer readings for your loaded miles while you have the patient in the back. So aside from the required documentation, the Dr. Russell requests what two sets of vitals. We're also looking for the following. If there's a chief complaint or other documentation of altered or decreased level of consciousness, if you can include the GCS in the vital section, that's super helpful. Also a chief complaint or other documentation of pain, if you can use the pain scale in the vital section. Also be sure to do your OPQRST, that's always helpful for us. Um, or if there's a chief complaint, and you guys have gotten a lot better uh, of doing this with the um, whole COVID thing, but if, you, if, they, if they've got a documentation of a uh, fever, if you could include the temperature in the vitals, that is also super helpful. So going back and looking at this, if the treatment or interventions are documented in the narrative, it isn't necessary to include them in the flow chart section of the PCR. Is that true or false? And we all know that's false. So. When data is entered into the assessment field, it needs to be consistent with what is documented in the narrative. So we've got um, the assessment field here showing positive for left and right leg edema. However, the narrative says moves all well without deficit, without distal edema. So again, if you were reviewing your report in that print format, you're going back, you're just dropping down through the flow and looking at all of these things to make sure they're consistent with, with one another. Anybody see a problem with this documentation? We've got a primary impression of no complaints and we've got a chief complaint of sore face. So the two are inconsistent with one another and um, is it kind of difficult for um, that no complaint or injury illness noted, we're going to talk about that a little bit further and how that gets in the way of compliance and billing. So this field should never be entered as below, patient complaint none. So a lot of people, and we're going to watch a video on this, in fact I might do this here in just a sec, but especially like with infants, dementia, Alzheimer's patients, uh, patients who are unresponsive or have a decreased level of consciousness. People have been trained that if they're not, you're supposed to document exactly what you were told. And that's not necessarily true. And I'm going to try to find this video here real quick and see if I can um, bring it up and find it. So this is a good resource, by the way, if anyone is interested. This is the PWW. Um, Ambulance compliance, these are the lawyers that do all of the training and compliance um, legal work for almost just about any EMS service in the country. So if you go onto their website, they've got a bunch of different stories that you can read here. We're gonna go to look at some more and I'm gonna try to find the one that I want to show you, but there's all kinds of little, these are short little blogs and you can watch them. They just take a minute or two um, if you see something in the topic um, interests you, uh, feel free to, oops, I don't want the last one. I think I want the next one. 
feel free to um, just take a peek at them. If you have any questions on that, give me a holler and we can discuss it further. Here's one on documenting pain. It's kind of helpful. It's just a quick, short little one. I'm trying to scroll down, but sorry, it's some of this stuff is data collection. Here we go, documenting chief complaint. We're gonna to listen to Amanda. And for any of you that came to the CADS training, Amanda is the gal that came to Cedar Woolley here and did the training for us several years ago. Uh, I guess I can't make them any bigger. Let's start with a pop quiz. True or false? When documenting a patient's chief complaint, you should always document exactly what the patient tells you. The answer? False. Many of you were probably taught the chief complaint is always what the patient tells you. This is usually true, but not always. The chief complaint should be the reason you are there treating the patient. In other words, why the patient needed an ambulance. This means you should never document none as the chief complaint or anything along those lines, such as none voiced. Let's say you're dispatched for a patient with an altered mental status. This patient is typically a and times four and his wife called 911 because he suddenly seemed out of it and confused. Upon arrival, the patient is alert to person only. When you ask him what's wrong, he says nothing, I feel fine. What should you document as the chief complaint? Altered mental status. This is why you were called and why the patient needs ambulance transport. You should also never document causes or conclusions as the chief complaint, such as alcohol, ETOH, or intoxicated. Many of us consume alcohol without requiring ambulance transport at the end of the night. This means even if a patient has been drinking, alcohol is not the patient's chief complaint. Obviously, the actual chief complaint will depend on the patient's condition, but it could be confusion, unconsciousness, vomiting, or many other possibilities. Alcohol may be the cause of those patient's symptoms, but it is not the patient's chief complaint. Documenting the chief complaint as the reason the patient requires an ambulance doesn't mean you ignore what the patient tells you or the circumstances that led to the patient's current condition. In our first example, you should document in your narrative that the patient stated he felt fine. You would then go on to explain the patient's symptoms and your assessment. In our second example, you could include in your narrative that the patient admitted to drinking alcohol, smelled of alcohol, or was observed drinking alcohol to further explain why the patient was experiencing their symptoms at that time. Bottom line, you should document the chief complaint as the primary reason the patient needed an ambulance. Okay, thank you, Amanda. So um, moving on from there, we again, we should never have chief complaint of none. If this, no complaint, injury or illness noted, and chief complaint of none, then why one of these? Why, being, why are we choosing a transport disposition? If I see those two, I'm I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is a non-transport. This is not a, maybe not even a patient patient. So um, if they're being transported, there should be a primary impression or chief complaint. And, and like Amanda said, we shouldn't really ever have none for a chief complaint on a transport. We're gonna talk now about free text narratives. Um, there's currently no, the city of Cedar Woolley Fire Department does not currently require you to use one of the um, narrative formats, but your narrative has got to paint a vivid picture of all aspects of the incident. And it must contain complete uh, accurate information about the DRAT, and we'll talk about DRAT. Um, but right now, if you're currently using the chart format or the SOAP format, that's, that's okay as long as we're capturing all of the information included in the draft. So we're gonna talk about the draft and this is a PWW um, format that they came up with to kind of walk you through the steps of your incident to make sure that we're not leaving any information out. So the first um, letter in the draft is for dispatch. What were you dispatched for? Who, you know, first of all, what unit are you? Who dispatched you? 
uh, what were you dispatched for, and the patient's reported condition. So I've, I've got a couple of examples here. One of Burlington example, Med 1819, was dispatched by Skagit 911 Med. Of course, we all know now that that's changed to the Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta Echo, so you could put that in there for a patient with chest pain and difficulty breathing. Uh, or another example, 855-19, dispatched by Skagit 911 to a oh, let's say a Bravo call for a patient um, at the above address for a 45-year-old female with shoulder and wrist pain from a fall. What you find, Remember, what you find on scene can be completely different than what you're dispatched to, and that's okay. Um, you just need to be sure and dispatch or document what you were dispatched to. The next letter in the DRAT is for the response. How did you respond? Data fields can be used to capture your driving information, your re response mode descriptors, your lights and sirens, non-lights and sirens, that type of thing. So long as your priority is emergent, it should always be emergent because you're dispatched by 911 and you respond immediately. And the CFR language uh, defines an emergency response as one in which the ambulance entity begins as quickly as possible to take the steps necessary to respond to the call. It doesn't say you have to flip on your lights or sound your siren. So um, you're always gonna be responding emergent, emergently even to a lift assist or citizen assist. The non-emergent is reserved for those inner facility type calls where uh, we need to go pick a patient up at two o'clock in the afternoon and take them to their dialysis appointment. We don't do those type of transports, so we're never gonna be using the non-emergent. Um, so here's an example of how you can document your response. Med 55 responded immediately with aid 5529. Here's where you would document any of your delays. Um, somebody hit the I-5 bridge yesterday and traffic was all buggered up or um, trains in Burlington, which never happens. Um, also, you could, you know, note any cancellation of it, any uh, other incoming units, that type of thing. The first A in the DRAT is for your arrival. Here's where you start to paint your picture. This is what the billing staff is relying on um, to make a determination of medical necessity. What were you told by the bystanders or the patient or the family or the caregivers? What did you see? The patient condition, their position, their surroundings. What did you smell? Smoke, gas, urine, alcohol, ketones. And ask clarifying questions of if the patient's able to answer of them, if not any bystanders or caregivers. This should include history. A lot of times history is helpful with medical necessity. So uh, be sure to include that information. The next A is your assessment. Again, the assessment tab can be used to gather information. Um, just a word of caution to be sure that it's not inconsistent with other information in the patient care report. This example here, um, head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, head and face, no abnormalities. Yet the narrative goes on to state there was blood on the floor and the patient was bleeding from a wound above his right eye. So just watch for those inconsistencies. The first T in DRAT is for the treatment. Um, documenting the clinical interventions provided to the patient is a key component of the narrative, but it has to do more than identify the treatment provided. And we've all heard this before, and we've probably seen this little thing hanging out in the stations. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about this for just a little sec here. Um, treatment has four parts to it. The clinical indications, the description of the treatment, the identity of the practitioner who performed the treatment and the results of the um, treatment and the reassessment of that treatment. So in other words, answer these four questions. Um, what was done? Why was it done? Who did it? And how did it go? Was it successful, unsuccessful? Patient's condition improved, worse, that type of thing. And remember three of those four intervention components may be entered into the flow chart, depending on what the treatment is. So. Um, what was done, oxygen, EKG, IV, who did it? You'll want to list the provider who actually did that. And how did it go? Was the patient, was it successful? Was it a successful IV start? Um, after you administered oxygen, was the patient's condition improved? 
But the last one, however, has to be documented in the narrative and it pertains to the patient's conditions or symptoms. So we talk about why was that intervention necessary? What, what, what patient condition, um, what, was, what were their signs that exhibited the need for oxygen or EKG? Were they having chest pain? Were they hypoxic? That type of thing. So that has to be documented in the narrative. So you ask yourself, what about BLS treatment you provide that might not be an actual intervention, but nonetheless is part of the patient care provided and needs to be documented in order to paint a complete and accurate picture of the patient's condition. So here's an example. The patient was unable to get up due to severe weakness and exertional dyspnea. He was rolled onto a blanket and lifted to the stretcher by four fire personnel. So that's not an actual intervention, but it's part of the patient treatment. And it talks about um, what you're doing, how it was being done, uh, why it was necessary, who did it. So here are some examples for some of that um, BLS type treatment assistance. When we see the word assistance, describe the assistance. So for example, assistance off the ground due to the weakness or assistance in ambulating due to an unsteady gait or severe intoxication. Assistance transferring to the stretcher due to exertional dyspnea or pain. Um, splinting, maybe for a possible fracture. Um, position of comfort, supine on the stretcher with a pillow under their right knee. Coaching, maybe you need to do some coaching to help a patient who's um, hyperventilating or has anxiety to slow their breathing. That's part of patient treatment. Uh, again, are you seeing results from that? Is it getting better, worse, helping, not helping, that type of thing? Restraints, if you've got a combative, combative patient um, who's a potential risk to self, self or others. Or medical supervision or monitoring of airways, vitals, level of consciousness, or any changes during transport. Maybe bandaging, wound care to control bleeding. So when we see the term assist or position of comfort, there's, we're asking a few questions. Why was assistance or a certain position of comfort required? And how was the patient assisted? And what was the position of comfort or assistance provided? And then the last T is the transport. Where to, why, what, for, how, and what's happening? What's happening during that transport? So here's an example. A patient was transported to United on priority to rule out an internal head bleed. Another set of vitals was obtained and the patient was monitored for any changes to his, due to his head injury and being anticoagulated. His pain decreased to two out of 10 upon arrival. He was taken to room 12 and transferred from the stretcher to the bed via four person sheet transfer. So that kind of sums up, what are you doing in route? Um, and if you're monitoring the patient, were there any changes? In this case, his pain decreased uh, by the time that you arrived. Here's another example, transported ALS to Skagit for further evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment. The patient was continually monitored and tolerated transport well. Her pain decreased to two out of 10, so no additional pain medication was administered. And that's an example you could use where you start an IV in anticipation of perhaps having to give pain medication, but ended up not giving it. So that justifies the start of the IV, and, and then, but then it also documents why it wasn't used. So your narrative is gonna distinguish the story of your patient care report from the mere collection of the data. The clinical justification is found in the narrative by the picture that you're painting. So we have this example here. This report was written, I'll give you a second to read through it, but this report was written by uh, one at Burlington had like four new EMTs come on board. And I went over and did a training with them. And this was the first report written by one of these EMTs after their training. And I don't know what their reporting writing looked like beforehand, but I was pretty impressed with how this person took all this information and was able to put it into a pretty thorough narrative. So I'll give you a second to just look through that. You can see we got the 10 out of 10 pain scale. We got the fact that the patient was on a blood thinner. Ah, 
how she was assisted to her feet. One firefighter supporting her right leg. So that kind of gives you an idea of, um, you know, it's, it's a fall patient and I've seen fall patients come across with a, maybe about a six sentence narrative. And I, I just wanted to share this because I was really pretty impressed with how this EMT documented this first call that I ever reviewed of his. So. Okay, we're gonna move on and talk about signatures here. And fortunately ESO, has validations built into the program that won't let you lock or complete a call without proper signatures. I just wanna give you some heads up on some things that we're seeing and then just a reminder of who can sign when, what, and how. So on the signatures tab, the first thing that we have is the provider signature and um, we require at least two be on file. And we're looking for the lead, the person who was the lead caregiver and the driver or an additional caregiver listed on the PCR. And it, you can get three. I mean, if you've got an ALS provider who's done an ALS assessment on this patient, it, it wouldn't hurt to have them sign as well. Currently, it's not required by Medicare, but at some point it may be. Um, but it wouldn't hurt. And, you know, if they look over your report as well, that's super helpful. Uh, billing authorization. So we all know that there's three sections to the billing authorization. There's the patient or the parent of a minor can sign in section one. Section two can be signed by an authorized representative. And then finally, the third section can be completed by the EMS provider and facility personnel. Patient, we need to know, um, first of all, that they've acknowledged that we have provided them with a copy of our notice of privacy practices. And then also their assignment of benefits. So when a patient receives Medicare, they receive an ambulance benefit and that benefit is theirs. In order for us to submit a claim to benefit, uh, Medicare and receive payment from them, that patient has to assign their benefits to us. So that's why we're looking for their uh, signature. Here's the um, language from Medicare. The ambulance crew must obtain the signature from the patient at the time of service unless the patient is physically or mentally unable to sign. So this does not include refused. Refused means that the patient's refusing to allow the assignment of their benefits. Uh, if the patient's altered, combative, a psych patient and refusing to sign, they may not be capable of making a clear, informed and rational decision. One of the below reasons would be a more appropriate reason they were unable to sign, whether they were altered or having a psych emergency or intoxicated or um, substance abuse. A true refusal means that the patient is competent to acknowledge what that means. And that reason must relate to the patient's um, inability to sign, not the crew's inability to ask. We see this from time to time. Patient unable to sign due to receiving ongoing care in the ER or patient NCT. Um, so PWW went in and did, uh, they were the lawyers on a, for a provider that was um, where Medicare was asking to have their money refunded because the patient care report lacked appropriate signatures. And this was one of those patient in CT. And so they asked the provider, um, or the provider said, well, we couldn't because they were in the CT. And they, the Medicare looked at the patient care report and saw that the patient was in the back of the ambulance for 12 minutes. So they asked, well, why didn't you get a signature while you had that patient in there for 12 minutes? They said, well, they were having a stroke. I couldn't. Well, had that um, section three been documented stroke deficits or ongoing stroke, it would have been fine. But because they use this patient in, CT, in the CT, it wasn't sufficient for Medicare and they had to give their money back on that claim. So another thing that we see time to time is patient can't operate or figure out how to sign using the tablet. Then what, remember these, this is Burlington's, but we have the same thing here. Paper signature, if, they, if it's an electronic issue and they can't figure it out, you can have them sign a paper 
copy. And then you should always check your patient's signature, always, always, and do this before you lock your call. If you get something like this for a patient's signature, just witness that. Um, you can put your, print your name and then for address, you can even you know, just do the 325 Metcalf, use the city address here and then sign. But you should, um, if you see an X or one of those little sketchy little scribbly things, you might wanna just witness it so that it's documented that yes, the patient was the one signing that. The second section, section two is patient representative. And this is only if the patient is physically or mentally unable to sign and that reason must be documented. So here's a list of the authorized signers and it's kind of very vague. A relative or other person who arranges treatment or handles the patient's affairs can be a son, a daughter, a spouse, a neighbor, whoever, whoever arranges that type of treatment. It cannot be because the patient requested. If the patient is physically and mentally capable of signing, they must sign. And so we'll see people say, patient requested POA sign. Uh -uh. If the patient is physically or mentally capable of, capable of signing themselves, they have to. And then finally, section three, we're gonna get down to the EMS personnel and facility signatures. This is a last resort and it should rarely be used, but if it is, it should only be used when the patient's physically or mentally incapable of signing and the reason is documented and there are no authorized representatives available to sign on the patient's behalf. And then this next slide is a big one. Be sure that both the first and last name of the facility RN usually who's signing this document has the first and last name printed. Um, Jan S is not going to fly with med. They cannot find, figure out who Jan S is. So please be sure to print both the first and last name. So some of the resources for this were the PWW short clips. I um, took you to that website. If you type in PWW ambulance, it'll direct you to their website. And you know those those short clips, you just might find something of interest there. Um, the CADS, there may be a book laying around. There were several folks from Cedar Woolley that attended the CADS training back in, I, I want to say 2017, maybe, um, maybe 18. And then one of the best resources is your partners or other providers review each other's reports and help each other out, just um, making sure that everything's thorough and complete. So this is the part where I would ask if you had any questions, but since I'm not there, um, if you do have any questions, I've got my email down below here, or you can call my desk phone or cell phone um, if there's anything that you need further clarification on. So the second section of our training is going to be a HIPAA review. And this, I'm going to tell you the sections two, three, and four are going to be lightning round because you have listen to me yap for long enough. So I'm going to go through a little bit of information and then I'm going to show you some resources. And remember I talked about um, there's going to be a lot of uh, reading and um, acknowledgement. So we'll, uh, we'll do a little bit of that here and I'll give you your homework. So section two is just a simple little HIPAA review. I want to discuss um, the two parts to HIPAA, there's the privacy part and the security part. The privacy part speaks to the patient's rights. The security part speaks to what we do to protect their health information. And we have policies and forms for both and we'll talk about where those are um, and what have you. So the patient rights, um, patients have a right to access, copy or inspect their protected health information they have a right to request an amended, amendment to their health information. We don't have to grant it if we believe that it's correct, but we'll take their request and keep it in their file. They have a right to request an accounting of all disclosures of their protected health information. What attorneys have you given this my information to? They can request that. They have a re right to request restriction on use and disclosure of their PHI. So an example of this would be if a patient Let's say they don't want their 
um, their auto insurance bill for an accident that they were in because they don't want their insurance to go up, they can request, they can restrict us from submitting it to their auto insurance. However, they have to pay us at that time for the ambulance transport. If they don't, we can bill their auto insurance. They also have a right to notice a breach of unsecured protected health information. So if we learn that um, their PHI has been compromised, we need to provide them with the uh, breach of that. And so this notice of privacy practices lets them know that we will do that. It also talks about what we can disclose without their permission. Does anybody remember the three things that we can disclose without patients written permission? T, P, and O, treatment, payment, and operations. So uh, anything treatment related, face sheet, demographics, that type of thing can be disclosed completely. Uh, payment, operation, both of those uh, we apply the minimal ne necessary rule to. For example, for payment, if let's say we're sending a patient to the collection agency, they don't need to know the treatment provided in the diagnosis code, but they need to know the patient demographics, address, phone numbers, that type of thing in order to perform their functions. On the other hand of that, the O portion, operational portion, let's say for example, your MPD is conducting a review, they're gonna show you all the treatment, maybe give you the gender and age of the patient, but they're not gonna give you the patient name and address because they don't need to do that in order to accomplish the um, QA, QI review. And then the last thing I have here is patient rights. How does a patient learn about their rights? The notice of privacy practices, and that's where you come in. So when you have the patient sign the tablet, they are acknowledging that you have provided them a copy of the city's notice of privacy practices. So we need to make sure that we are doing that. Some people may refuse and that's okay, but you need to be making sure that you're giving that if they're and you're letting them know about that. So that's the privacy side. We're going to move on to the security side. The security side of um, HIPAA has three different categories that we look at. We look at the technical side, which is things such as your unique username and password, um, encrypted um, correspondence, um, timeouts, that type of thing in programs. I know they make you crazy. The physical security is locked buildings, door keys, locked file cabinets and offices. And then the administrative portion of that is the HIPAA compliance policy. And we're gonna talk about that here. Um, the administrative portion requires several different things. First, uh, we do a risk assessment and we look at all of our um, security and um, both physical and uh, technical. Uh, we look at our policies and procedures, we provide the training and then we conduct ongoing compliance. And that's kind of what we're doing here today. So I'm gonna show you where to find our HIPAA policy. And then um, it's like almost 200 pages. So like I said, there's a lot of reading involved. Um, it's got the policy, it's got the forms and each individual policy. Um, but what I need from you as part of acknowledgement that you have um, received this training and read the policy is on page 189 of the policy is the acknowledgement uh, employee assurances. And then I think page 192 might be the fourth page of that is um, the signature page. So we're gonna want you to certify the receipt and understanding of the policy and sign and return. Oh, there it is, page 193. So I'm gonna talk about where to go to get that little gem. And that is going to be in your ERS library. You wanna go down to training material in the library and um, over here, fourth one down is the city of Cedar Woolly HIPAA compliance policy. And we can download that here. Open it and we'll take a peek at it. Uh, like I said, there are a hundred and some pages to this. But it starts off with just kind of going through the background and compliance and what we're doing 
to be compliant with HIPAA, how we protect, um, what protected health information is, and uh, how we're protecting our patients. And then it goes on, lists all the different policies that we have in place, page numbers, and then it goes further and it has forms associated with all of those policies. If we go down to the very uh, last, second to last one, form 32 on page 189 is the staff member assurances. I'm gonna just try to get us there really quick here. A little bit further. Okay, and just going to touch on a few of the highlights of this. Um, so it just talks about general HIPAA information concerning the patients. Confidential, we've all watched the little PWW video and understand what that means. Uh, we may want to go, so you, what I want you to do is read through specifically this, definitely this um, document beginning on page 189. It talks about how employees are gonna use only computers owned and secured by the city to access protected health information and complete their patient care reports. You're gonna make every effort to protect all data on city devices in accordance with the policies and procedures and not permit unauthorized use or access to data on those devices. Um, not communicate any PHI using an unsecure email server. So for example, if Frank and I are emailing patient information, staying within our server here, it's, it's secure. But if I'm sending something to a third party, it's not necessarily secure as it's traveling through time. So we've got um, encrypted email service that we use to communicate in that way. So you should never be sending information um, via email on an unsecure server. And we talk about workstations. Um, all of your usernames and passwords should not be disclosed to any other individual. If you're, I know there's some people that like to write their narratives in a Word document so that um, they can utilize the spell check in a better function. Um, if you do that, it should only be done on a city workstation and it should not include patient demographics. We will not be storing any uh, PHI on personal devices and this includes images stored on phones or cameras. Paperwork should never be left unsecure at any time. I remember um, shortly after I got here, maybe six months or so, I saw an alert on ERS that I think it was Keith for put up there um, about walking into station two and having face sheets laying all over the station. You need to make sure that you're storing that uh, paper, the paper documentation securely as well. And that's why the black boxes are, I think they're still there. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're in a situation where you've got PHI that doesn't need to go anywhere else, it needs to be shredded, destroyed. If you don't have a shredder, get it here to the city and we'll put it in one of these, um, let's say if you're up, I don't know if you have that access to that up at um, station two, but if you don't, we need to make sure that it is disposed of properly. So make sure that gets here. Um, it talks about the employees paying the particular attention to the need to know and minimum necessary rule section of the compliance policy. And that's as it relates to written, verbal, electronic, and photographic protection. Remember, a picture can be PHI, so. Um, and then it talks about protecting data on all of our devices here. Um, and goes on further to talk about trainees and observers that ride along will be required to um, sign a copy of our confidentiality agreement prior to writing. Um, all new personnel prior to performing any job duty should undergo HIPAA training. Um, and ongoing education related to HIPAA. And that's kind of what we're doing today. So when we talk here about notice of privacy practices, and this again speaks to what we were just talking about. As part of the city of Cedar Rowley's ongoing education related to HIPAA and patient rights, I acknowledge that I've received this instruction and understand that when a patient and their representatives and or their representative signs the electronic tablet, they're acknowledging that they received a copy of our notice of privacy practices. 
and you agree to provide every patient a copy of the city's NPP at the time of service. In lieu of a paper copy, the patient or their representative will be instructed on how it may be in, obtained on the city's website or by calling the HIPAA compliance officer to request one. So if they don't want the paper and they're requesting to just look it up, you can tell them that they can find it on the fire page on the city website. All personnel must report any known or suspected breaches of unsecured PHI in all security incidents immediately um, to myself. If, uh, if an incident occurs, or if you think that one's occurred, you should, if, you, if you have knowledge of that, you should report it immediately. And the reason for that is the OIG has issued guidance that you have 60 days from the time that you know about an incident to make the proper notification. So if it's, um, I think once you reach the 500 threshold, you have to notify the media. Um, you have to notify the OIG on any breaches. So we want our clock to be starting as soon as we know about it. So don't hold on to that information for 50 days and then say, oh, I've known about it for 50 days. Now I'm going to report it because now we've got 10 days to make those proper notifications. So be sure if you think that there's uh, been a breach to report it, you can do that anonymously, um, reporting to myself, just however you, you know, if you want to just type something up and leave it for me, that's fine too. Um, it may not be a breach, so, but at least we have the opportunity to conduct an assessment and make that determination. So um, then the final just says that you'll uh, return any PHI that you have in your possession or any equipment um, upon termination with the city. So the final page is page 193. Um, this certifies that you've uh, received the city's HIPAA compliance training. You've read and understand the HIPAA policies and procedures that have been provided and agreed to abide by the policies or be subject to disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment or of any membership associated with the city of Cedar Woolley. So it's not a contract of employment and does not alter the nature of your existing relationship with the uh, city of Cedar Woolley and, and yourself. So um, what I'm gonna do, I think, is I'm gonna put a binder in the training room back in your department, and I'm gonna have some blank forms there for you to pull out and sign and then place back in the book. Um, and that way that'll, um, serve as notification that you have received this training, read this 100 and whatever page, 194 page HIPAA document and um, acknowledge, make that acknowledgement in writing by returning this form here. So that is our HIPAA training in a nutshell. We're gonna go back to our um, PowerPoint presenta presentation here. And whoopsies, wrong view. Move on from here. We're going to talk about um, general compliance. And this is going to be very similar to um, what you just um, learned in your HIPAA compliance. So we're going to talk about how to locate the compliance material, understand the compliance overview, and we'll give you your homework assignment. So first of all, compliance is gonna be located in the same location as the HIPAA compliance in the library here. Um, there's actually three documents related to HIPAA. There's the compliance plan, there's the policies and forms, and then there's the code of conduct. And we'll just briefly look at each one of these. So you can get just an idea of what they are, but your homework is going to be to read through these, to come to me with any questions, and then finally to sign the code of conduct. But this just talks about why a compliance program is important um, and the monitoring of our compliancy um, it kind of just summarizes the entire program. 
that we'll respond immediately if we detect any misconduct. We are, want to have open lines of communication. And most importantly, I want you all to know who your compliance officer is. And lucky me, that um, is going to be Carol Nipper. So if anybody ever comes in here to do an audit and ask who your compliance um, officer is, please know that it's me. Um, the attorneys at PWW say that's one of the first things they ask the line employees when they when they go in is if they know who their compliance officer is and you'd be surprised how many people don't. So moving on from here, um, just scrolling down talks about the compliance policy again, the goal of our compliance policy, the summary of the program, designating a compliance officer again. Who's that? That's me. So be sure that you know that if anybody ever asks you, um, conduct we conduct internal monitoring reviews, audits. We also audit our billing service uh, systems design. Um, and this policy just kind of outlines that, what our guiding principles are, um, that we expect everybody to be trained and be uh, familiar with our code of conduct and our compliance policy and act professionally and protect patient information and all of the above. So you'll read through this. It talks about the compliance officer, talks about our education and training, ambulance crew roles. Um, so here's this pertains specifically to you. Um, the training that you'll need to have and we just finished is the need to accurately Truthfully and completely document patient care, including the patient's condition, services provided, how the patient was found and moved, and other necessary information on the patient care report and other documentation. Um, we need to include the documentation of the origin and destination and the mileage traveled, collection of patient or other acceptable signatures, and then review and sign all the PCRs and the importance of maintaining your licensure, your uh, EMT or paramedic certification with the state. Then it talks about what I do here on a, a pre-billing level. Talks about the role of the compliance officer, monitoring and reviews. We talked about this, coding and billing decisions. So fortunately, um, our transports are all getting two sets of eyes. They're getting mine and then they're getting a set at systems design. So we hope we're hopeful that we're covering all of our bases in that. It talks about False Claims Act and the anti-kickback statute. So basically false, false claims could be something as simple as bogus signature. Um, and then anti-kickback statute has more to do with arrangements that are made for um, services. And we don't really have any of those that where we expect referrals or or a nursing home respects referrals from us. So we're kind of off the hook on that, but it just talks about that. And we have the language in our compliance policy just to cover that. Um, talks about billing and claims, risk assessment, auditing and, monit auditing and monitoring again. Um, and I might back here, overpayments, refunding patients who or their insurance when there's a credit on their account, got 90 days to do that, uh, responding to misconduct. Uh, and then here it talks about government investigation. So you'll wanna um, play co pay close attention and read all of that. It tells you how to respond if the feds come knocking the door down. Um, uh, mechanism for reporting compliance concerns. And we'll look at that in the forms there protection of our personnel, exit interview. We, we would like to do exit interviews on folks as they're leaving, just so we can find out how we can be doing better. So that there is our um, compliance policy. And then here are the There we go. We'll look at the policies and forms just real briefly. And take this over here. So again, here's um, policies on 
patient care report documentation. It lists all of those. And then it's got some forms at the bottom. Uh, includes, here's your patient care report documentation. So you'll really wanna um, take a look at that. Review an amendment of reports, who can do that and how that's handled. Uh, physician certification statements, we don't do non-emergent transports um, routinely, if ever, but we do have language in here pertaining to PCR or PCSs, um, should we ever need that. Um, our internal billing audit, what I'm looking for, so you'll want to see that. You'll want to take a look at that. And then um, identifying refunding um, overpayments, we talked about briefly about that. If a patient can't uh, pay in a timely manner, we do have a financial disclosure form where they can establish payment arrangements that's handled through systems design. Um, and then there's a couple, a couple of the forms that we would return to them after we make a determination on that. Um, excluded parties background checks, that's something that I do every month. It's on the OIG's website. And I just go through and I type in each and every one of your names just to make sure that you are not excluded from practicing um, with the OIG. And they can exclude you for simple things such as being in default of a student loan to something more criminal in nature. So just know, you, you know, we, we're checking that every month so that we're doing our due diligence. Um, so if you owe money for a student loan, pay it. We don't want to see your name on there. Um, so that talks about that. We talk about licensure checks, uh, making sure your certifications are up to date. Um, Frank and I work together on that. He works with the EMS office in the state um, to make sure that that's happening, but you also need to do your part. So make sure that we're not lagging there. Um, if an individual doesn't have a current license, we have to stop you from even riding on the ambulance um, without a if your certification is, you, you can't be involved in any patient care and that can include driving an ambulance. So make sure that um, we're getting those things updated your, when you get your renewals that making sure Frank has those. And um, because if you submit a claim with a person who is not properly certified, that is also considered a false claim under the False Claims Act. Um, here we talk about risk identification. So we do a risk assessment to look at our policies and make sure that we're, uh, we have pretty much covered all our bases. Make sure these are your rights in a government investigation. This tells you what you need to do um, if, if it's, again, if the feds come knocking at your door. First thing, one of the first things you want to do is immediately um, let myself know. You don't want to interfere or prevent them from conducting their uh, investigation, but we do want to make sure that we're dealing with uh, proper authorities and not a fraud situation. So um, complaint and concern reporting. This is where if you have something that you think is going on that you're questioning, you can use this form to fill out and submit to me. And then we'll um, take a look. Um, just basically says, is there anybody else who knows about this? How do you discover it? Blah, 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 that type of thing. Again, if you want to do that anonymous, anonymously, you can. Um, and then finally, exit interview questions. So that is on the um, forms and policies. And then finally, code of conduct. We'll take a peek at this. And this kind of summarizes everything all together in a little 10 page document. And it talks about um, HIPAA and privacy and a statement of commitment to do everything um, by law and um, our ethical reputation and that type of thing. And that you're um, receiving the training and you're gonna comply with all laws, whether it be HIPAA or OIG or Medicare or Medicaid, Apple Health, all of those. And they're all wrapped into this documentation training. So it also talks about our patient HIPAA rights, that type of thing. Um, patient billing, integrity of the workforce, um, that we're not going to hire anybody with a criminal <laughs> conviction. 
um, conflicts of interest. And this has more to do with your governing council who actually makes, um, enters into agreements with other parties. So, um, confidential information, again, under HIPAA, federal, state, and local law regulations, anti-kickback laws, we talked a little bit about that. Um, business arrangements with healthcare facilities and other referral sources. We don't have referral sources, so we're off the hook there, but that basically says that we're gonna take all necessary actions to make sure we comply with any uh, federal and state laws. Um, the work environment, just, this just kind of outlines that we strive to manage and operate our business here in ways to ensure there's minimal risk to patients, our personnel, visitor, and the community environment. So we want to make sure that we are complying with all safety, hazardous waste, and other environmental care policies that have been established by the city. Um, transactions, anti-competitive prices, we don't set our rates, so and for the most part, um, 80, 90 percent of our patients are uh, capitated through Medicare, and Medicaid, anyway. So, um, gifts to government representatives. Well, we don't have to worry about that again because we, our rates are set by the county. Um, talks about government investigations, individual judgment, non-discrimination, and then. The last section is implementation of the code of, code of conduct and your responsibility to report compliance concerns. And then there are disciplinary actions if there are concerns. Um, no retaliation for good faith reporting. That's basically the whistleblower um, statute. There, there, there will be no retaliation if you're reporting something in good faith to try to make our uh, city better. And then we'll monitor our compliance efforts. And obviously there's consequences if we fail to comply. And revisions, we'll let you know about revisions. If there's any questions about the code of conduct, you'll wanna contact me again. Um, and then this says promotion and adherence to the code of conduct for way heavily in personal performance evaluation. And I think that goes without saying um, I think that just happens on a day-to-day -day basis in general. So the last page of this is the acknowledgement that you've received the copy of the Code of Conduct. It's your responsibility to read through it and contact me with any questions. So, and I think what I'll do is put some blank copies of this in the notebook as well. So all of those are gonna be found in the um, training material portion of the library in ERS. So oh, that was compliance. I think I'm just gonna whip through these last couple of slides. The section four was the code of conduct and I just showed you where to find that. So acceptance of the compliance policies and how you'll conduct yourself in accordance with both HIPAA and general compliance, read, sign and return page 10. So I'll put some blank copies in that book that I put in the training room. I'll also put a sign in sheet so that you can sign in that you have watched the video and then you can I'll pull out one of those blank forms, sign it, and put it in the uh, back in the notebook. Um, you are not considered signed off on this training until you have signed the log and then return the two signed signature pages, the uh, employee assurances and the code of conduct. You'll want to, if you're not a person who's in the station, maybe your on-call person that shows up once every couple months, you can, in lieu of signing the training log, print the two, um, page 193, I think, of the employee assurances and page 10 of the code of conduct, sign it, scan it, and your email receipt back to me will be certificate that you um, attended the training. So you can do that in lieu of um, using the book that I'm gonna put back in the fire department. So I think that's it. Um, thank you for bearing with me and I wish I could have done this in person. If you have any questions at all related to documentation, HIPAA, the general compliance or the code of conduct, please feel free to get a hold of me. Um, pop on up. I got a mask here in my office. I'll put it on and um, we can have a face-to-face. -face. Or if you want to report something anonymously, just type up a note or leave a message on the phone or 
have somebody else do it for you. I don't care, but I want you to know that we've got open lines of communication here. And um, I want to look into anything that you um, think might be questionable. So thanks again for your time. Appreciate it.